All for me grog, me jolly jolly grog. All for me beer and tobacco. Well, I spent all me tin with the ladies drinking gin. Now across the western ocean I must wander. Where are me crew, me, crew. me jolly jolly crew? They're all gone for beer and tobacco. Since the COVID came around and the pubs all they shut down, now I'm missing singing songs with you together. Oh, it's all for me grog, me jolly jolly grog. All for me beer and tobacco. Well, I spent all me tin with the ladies drinking gin. Now across the western ocean I must wander. Yes, across the western ocean I must wander. Well, welcome everyone to May's First Friday. Um, before we begin, I would like to make a few announcements. First, I would like to have our board member, Doug Muir, say a few words for the loss of one of Newburyport's preservationists and advocate for the Waterfront Park. Doug? Uh, yes, good evening, everyone. Um, many of you, I'm sure, uh, have already learned of the death of Bill Harris. There was a, a, a wonderful obit in the Daily News last month, and uh, Bill died April 21st, um, but uh, although he's gone, uh, many of us will always remember what a wonderful supporter he was of the museum and of an open waterfront where everyone could go. Uh, Bill worked with a number of organizations in addition to the museum. Uh, in fact, I think his game plan was to try to enlist uh, all of those uh, uh, organizations he worked with uh, to accomplish uh, his main theme, which was, as I say, the open waterfront. Bill and Elizabeth would come to many First Fridays, uh, and I can always remember when Bill would stride across the room towards me, I knew there was something on his mind, and there always was. There were always a lot of things on Bill's mind. Um, like any good lawyer, Bill had command of the facts, lots of facts. Uh, and many of us were treated to uh, a lengthy explanation of why he was right. But it was never just opinions, never just off the top of his head. It was always grounded in an encyclopedic knowledge of new report history. Um, we'll miss him. Uh, we'll miss him for a lot of reasons. Uh, some I've mentioned and some I'm sure you'll think of too. I'm sure many of you know Bill and Elizabeth, uh, were treated to, uh, uh, his explanation of why, uh, things were as they were and things were as they ought to be in his mind, but we'll miss him. Uh, greatly. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. And my condolences to his wife and family as well. It seems like yesterday that we switched from the social first Fridays to a Zoom platform. Um, a big thanks to Jack Santos, our board member and tech support, who made it possible this year to use this technology so we could continue our programming um, with our membership. However, with the onset of winter or, or warmer months, vaccinations and the state starting to open up for outdoor gatherings, we plan to return to our um, social first Fridays to be outdoors. This will be from June through September. Um, these events will remain free to our members, but you'll need to make a reservation since we plan not to, succeed, to exceed 75 attendees. Yes, we can push the capacity higher, but we also have to factor in the staff, the volunteers and the presenters to make the program successful. We wish to start off conservative, not knowing how outdoor gatherings will actually proceed. We um, uh, will post all of these events on our website and um, Kathy Stark is doing a great job sending out constant contacts 
Um, so to reserve your spot, be on the lookout of our announcements for First Fridays. We also have a busy summer planned with several weddings, rentals, and programming for our membership, all the while adhering to COVID guidelines. Taking a page from Governor Baker's songbook, who said he could not wait to attend an outdoor concert, we thought, well, maybe we can do some mini concerts and um, support the local artists at the same time. It's outdoors, on the water, and for a modest fee of $10 a ticket for our members, we have a variety of concert times and music. Most events will have a tent, even a Sunday afternoon concert where we will encourage attendees to bring their own picnic, drink and chairs to listen to Doug Hammer in June and later the Spain Brothers in August. We also will have John Tavano and Richard Kimball return. And if anyone attended last summer's concert, uh, we won't change a thing except for the ticket price. Instead of $5, we're gonna charge 10. <laughs> um, once again, we will be under the sky and hopefully another enjoyable evening. And we also will have Liz um, Frame and the Kickers for a Friday evening and then a Sunday matinee concert to conclude the Newburyport Chamber Music Festival. Besides music, Jeff Rapsis is returning on Friday the 13th for a showing of, I'm gonna, I'm gonna mess this up, but I'm gonna try it, Nosfra R2. Somebody might have to um, tell me how to say that correctly, but this is the 1922 original big screen adaption of the Dracula movie. And it is maritime approved since there is a boat scene, so I'm told. Again, please check the events page and information and we will provide the link so you can make the purchase of the tickets. Also, the Custom House um, Maritime Museum continues to collaborate with other Newburyport nonprofits. We are helping to support by cross promoting or actually giving access to the lawn. Custom House Walkway is becoming a lovely, admire the gardens, um, a lovely walkway, just starting um, with the Newburyport Horticultural Society and the ladies, Catherine and Dawn from the Waterford Trust have been really tending to the flower beds and cleaning up all the litter and everything from the winter. So it looks tremendous. So enjoy the walkway. Please come join Chris Howe for yogurt in the, for yogurt, for yoga in the park, also yogurt if you'd like to sit on the lawn on Wednesdays in May. And we're doing a fundraiser um, collaborating with Runway for Recovery on June 17th. And of course, the Greater Newburyport Favorite Poem Festival will be happening the afternoon in July 31st. The Firehouse Center for the Arts will be able to hold their Glee Club using the lawn for the week um, for their day camps for, their, for the kids. And of course, the Newburyport Horticultural Society held their recent plant sale, sale last um, May 1st. So all these efforts are not only to help other organizations get a footing, but it's also to help raise awareness of the Maritime Museum. It's all good and it's working wonderfully. So tonight I have the privilege of introducing John Mayer. Um, John is a graduate of the Hagley program in the history of capitalism, technology and culture in the University of Delaware's history department. That's a big mouthful. <laughs> I had to look it up. The program has been training graduate students interested in industrialization, capitalism, science, technology, consumption, business, labor, and the environment. See where this is going? <laughs> John has also a certificate in museum studies. He has a bachelor's degree in fine arts from the California College of Arts and Crafts. He served as a museum curator at the Maine Historical Society. He's been the curator at Strawberry Bank Museum in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, and the director and curator of the Manchester Historical Asso Association. John is the executive director at the Amesbury Carriage Museum. He began his work for the museum in March 2016 and is responsible for leading the organization towards its goal to establish a public space for exhibits, programs, and collections. 
The new venue, the Industrial History Center, is planned to open in 2021. And if you have not scoped it out, you should, even under construction, it's still beautiful. Greg Colling is the architect, but, and we share Greg here at the Customs House Maritime Museum for his per, um, preservation advice and guidance and professional um, input. So John has worked for over 30 years in the museum field with expertise in nonprofit administration, exhibit development, curatorial practice, care in ar architectural collections, and preservation of historic structures. It's a pleasure to welcome um, John tonight for finding in Amesbury the lure and potential of community history. Thank you, John. John, thank you very much. That was quite an introduction. I appreciate that very much. Um, and I'm delighted to be here. Um, I'm delighted to be part of your First Friday program and to support the work of the Custom House Maritime Museum. So as, as Joan has pointed out, um, you know, my work is completely involved in developing the Amesbury Carriage Museum and building our history center and actually helping to evolve an organization. I started, um, this is the beginning of my sixth year. We have um, really grown from a very small, all volunteer organization, was the first professional staff person. And um, little by little, we've really created, I think something that um, I hope you will come and see and um, feel the energy around the organization. So thank you, Joan. So I'm gonna jump right in to my program. Um, I've got a, a series of images that will introduce you to Amesbury and tell you a little bit about the program we're involved in. Um, it's not exactly linear, so you'll be challenged to follow the bouncing ball. My goal is to be done in time for there to be questions. So um, with, with no further ado, I'm gonna get into my program. And here we go. Got it already. So just, there we go. Um, I, uh, one of the things I enjoy about my work is um, interacting with my um, community. So at all times, I welcome email and questions about the work that we're doing. So my email is at the bottom of this, and I'll show it again at the end of the presentation. So I want to introduce you to Amesbury and tell you about the Amesbury Carriage Museum. Towards the end of my program, you'll see a little bit about the Industrial History Center. And throughout the presentation, I'll be talking about my work with the community and how that has influenced our programs. And then of course, it being Friday night, I hope that you're entertained. I hope you're inspired to learn more about your community. And I think a test for me will be to see if any of you connect with the Carriage Museum and perhaps become a member. Right. So here's my introduction. And first, I want to begin with the land acknowledgement. Um, this tour, if you will, takes place on the homeland of the Abenaki, Pawtucket, Pinnacook, and Wabanaki people, past and present. Um, sincere when I acknowledge and honor the land, waterways, and native people who have stewarded this area for generations. And I encourage you too to learn more about the first people of Massachusetts and their efforts today to protect, support, and share their history. Here I am welcoming you to Amesbury and uh, from Newburyport, you can see it's a very short distance up the Merrimack River. Um, I have uh, two or three themes that are part of our interpretation at the History Center. We begin with the falls at the Pow Wow River. There's a wonderful um, description of Amesbury from an uh, encyclopedia in 1792. And um, I think we found this very early on in our uh, research project. The water falls 100 feet within the distance of 50 perches. And I, I think it's um, 
five and a half yards. I forget, I should know exactly, but um, it's a surveying term. Um, it's about a quarter of a mile from the top of the falls to tidewater. And in 1792, there was a bloomery, which is an ironworks, five sawmills, seven grist mills, two linseed oil mills, a fulling mill and a snuff mill. And when we learned that, it was quite remarkable. And, and um, we, that's been part of our study in Amesbury. And I love the final um, sentence, the very irregular and grotesque situation of the houses and other buildings give the place a romantic appearance and afford in the whole one of the most singular views to be found in this country. So here's one of the um, activities that we've, we've done. We've recruited a number of volunteers who are involved in uh, industrial survey of Amesbury. And this is a rendering that um, Mike Pendergast developed based on that description from 1792. So on the left, you can see the flow of the river moving from left to right, and then the variety of mills um, that were located along it. Um, six dams, a footbridge, and tidewater to the right at the lower powwow. We worked with other source materials that we found in different repositories. This is an 1825 map, and, and one of the more historic events that happened in Amesbury was in 1796 when Jacob Perkins um, uh, from Newburyport came to Amesbury and took advantage of the water power there and built his nail factory. This map in 1825 was drawn just at the time the, the nail factory was being sold to what became the Salisbury Manufacturing Company. So this is a, a view of the original map it's from the collections of Peabody Essex Museum and the Phillips Library. Around that, that same time, John Barber, in his work studying Massachusetts town, did a rendering of Amesbury. This is the earliest view I found of the town. And it ties into this map that was made in 1849 that shows the growth of the mill yard. It's pretty easy to see the number and size of the buildings have uh, developed and become larger. Leading up to 1880, this aerial view that shows the mill yard and the sprawling uh, industrial town that evolved around it. In 1910, just two years before the closing of what was then the Hamilton Woolen Company, this insurance map was drawn and it gives a nice sense, a nice view of what the maximum size of the industrial complex was along the river. And then with our volunteer, we rendered that today. So you can see, uh, you know, there's about, um, you know, the, the most of the buildings on what I call the west bank of the powwow were lost, but there's quite a bit of integrity on the east side of the river, which was originally Salisbury. So one of our important themes is industrial power. This is a view of the upper dam on the powwow. It's still there today. And actually this is a great time of year to come to Amesbury with the spring flow. The, the river is really, um, it's wonderful. It's, it's very provocative to see. And for those who aren't familiar with water power sites, the technology is pretty straightforward and it's something that's been around for hundreds of years. There's a dam, there's a raceway or a flume that diverts the water through a gate to a water wheel that is attached to the machinery inside a mill where the work is done. And then the water flows back to the river where it can be used again. And in our maps, we see that. And here I'm highlighting some of the infrastructure that was part of the Jacob Perkins nail factory, pointing to the raceway where the nail factory was located and what you can't really see is how the water entered the building and then flowed back to the river. But with all the dams, it's easy to understand how that happened. Throughout the mill yard, there are artifacts that speak to different periods. 
there's actually a grist mill stone. It's not labeled. And if you don't know what you're looking at, you would think it was a very curious granite bench. But this was salvaged from uh, during the renovation of the mill yard in the 1980s. And it was located in a way that people could uh, celebrate uh, the past industrial history. Another bit of remains, and this one is a little bit off the beaten path. It's actually in the basement of the Newburyport Bank Lending Center. It used to be what was called Mill Number no. Eight. And a friend of mine who saw this picture said, What a sorry fate for this uh, turbine. When they renovated the building, instead of removing the turbine or saving it, they just poured their concrete around it. But this too was tied in to the water power that was all part of the system in Amesbury. Here's one of the mill buildings that still stands on the lower um, mill yard. This is mill number four. It was built in 1854. And as we explore the built environment, it's easy to see some of the features that were part of the system of industrial power. Here in the foundation of the building are some sockets that were part of the lowest dam on the powwow. And here this opening was the intake for the flow of water that came through the building and drove the turbine that in turn drove the, the belts and pulleys that powered the machines. So one of the great thrills with our survey group is actually to get into these buildings and explore. And here two of our, our members are looking at the tail race. This is actually in the basement of mill number four and with tide water, water comes in and out of that space, but this would have been the exit of water that had gone in, driven the different belts and pulleys that were important for the machinery. And this is a view of one of the weave rooms that was part of mill number four. I think the image is from around 1905 and it's from a collection at the Amesbury Public Library. Of course, water power doesn't work so well in a drought, so we recently, one of our um, volunteers was tracing the history of steam power in Amesbury. And we know there were steam engines. I'm, guess, um, I'm dating the first one to 1854. This is a view of a mill engine that's at the Hagley Museum in Wilmington, Delaware. Joan mentioned my graduate study, and this was a museum where I worked back in the uh, early 1980s. And to the delight of my wife, Deborah, Amesbury Carriage Museum has acquired a Porter steam engine. This is uh, a line cut that is exactly the engine that I was able to find in Rhode Island at the New England uh, Wireless and Steam Museum. And next Friday, we'll be bringing this engine into the Industrial History Center. It has a 42 inch flywheel and was about a 20 horsepower engine, which is quite enough power to drive a mill building. And it, um, with the march of progress, if you will, Amesbury welcomed hydroelectricity in 1916. This is a view of Lake Gardner Dam. You can see the um, um, hydroelectric house just to the right of the dam that was removed in the 1970s. And here's a view looking up the lower powwow. This is really quite a stark image um, and a time when Amesbury was pretty intensely industrialized. And what you can see is the diversion dam that's just beneath what was the lower hydroelectric station. And for those who know Amesbury and one of our wonderful breweries, uh, Brewery Savaticus, this is a view from their plaza looking across the Powwow River. And you can see the concrete bunker, the diversion dam and the farm of transformers that are still part of the electrical infrastructure in Amesbury, although hydroelectric power is no longer generated. The story of labor is also important to us. This is a quote from 1936 that um, one of my board members, Mary Chatney, really um, enjoys. Most of the people of Amesbury belong to the productive class. Very few are raised above the necessity of personal exertion. All are active and industrious, readily find employment and command good wages. It's a really nice way of, of describing 
the um, very much working class environment that was, is Amesbury, was and is Amesbury. There's a, a history of textile making that Amesbury was very much part of. And this is a, a, a subject that many of our volunteer researchers are, are getting involved in, and, and me too. We found this wonderful um, advertisement in the newspaper archives. It's from 1799, which is really quite early, the time when the nail factory was operating. But another um, person familiar to uh, Newburyport and Georgetown was Paul Moody, who served as an apprentice in the nail factory, but also was very much involved in machine building. We believe Paul Moody was uh, building carding machines and the, it was the Schofield brothers who had come to Newburyport and introduced that technology. And here, if you will, is the nail factory where in that building, um, we believe Paul Moody was setting up and carding wool that could be used for weavers or hat makers or other people processing this fiber. Old Sturbridge Village has a machine that's very much like what a Scoville carding machine would have looked like. And then in the textile industry at that time, there would have been um, domestic manufacturing or handloom weaving that was taking place. And we know this happened in Amesbury um, the agent of what was the Amesbury Flannel Manufacturing Company, Joshua Aubin, in his uh, memoir, proudly talks about the time where they were able to introduce um, power weaving. They took, they introduced these, um, the, he, and this is something we're trying to understand. Joshua says the first loom for weaving woolen warps was built at the Amesbury Company. This loom took the place of hand looms with 60 looms operating by water. So they were able to get rid of 60 weavers, most of them intemperate and troublesome, and substituted them with 30 girls who were more easily managed and did more and better, better work. So here's a view of what we're up. And here's where the location of the Amesbury Flannel Company was. There, all these buildings have been lost. And this is what uh, a, a um, female operative would look like. This is um, Winslow Homer engraving from the 1860s. And for those who are familiar with the Lowell story, it would be a familiar image. But Aubin wasn't exactly correct because in a history of uh, trade unions, Alice Henry um, comments on a period when the factory girls of Amesbury had a flare up they turned out because they were told they must tend two looms without any advance of wages. So this is a very common theme that happens in the history of technology. And we had another event that was also notable. Um, downtown Amesbury, right next to the bakehouse is a building called the Counting House. So this was, if you will, the company headquarters for then the Salisbury Manufacturing Company. And here's an image of the Counting House for the Hamilton Woolen Company. In 1852, a new agent was hired after Joshua Aubin retired. His name was John Purley Dave, um, Derby, who instituted um, some very new regulations that did away with some traditions that um, the workers had enjoyed. And the Derby strike of 1852, um, uh, a good percentage of the workers walked out and were never rehired. This broadside that's at the American Antiquarian Society is written from the perspective of the um, owners of the company. And they talk about the public mind becoming excited, flags suspended near the counting house with insulting mottos, great efforts to induce the remaining house to leave employ, and even a band of music parading the streets. So one of the workers who was involved in this was a young man whose name was, oops, I'm gonna go back here, um, George McNeil. And uh, McNeil left Amesbury 
he won, went on and found his way to Boston, where he was a member of the Bureau for the Statistics of Labor, and then also an advocate for the eight hour day and became quite um, important in the early efforts um, for the rights of workers. And, and he, he um, had his first experience in Amesbury, which is a, a, an important bit of history. So following this progression even more, um, after um, the power looms, the next, um, oops, my, sorry, I apologize. The next step in the progression was something that was invented by the Draper company, and it was an automatic magazine that would fill a shuttle with a new bobbin after the thread had run out. And here this woman would be managing 40 looms instead of the two that the operative was doing in the, 19, in the 1820s. She, in her left hand, has a shuttle with the bobbin up. Um, and again, her um, workplace would basically involve moving between these different machines and simply making sure that the bobbins are full and the machines are all operating. McNeil um, published an annual report in 1872 and was able to get a um, testimony from an Amesbury factor, factory operative. And I think this quote is really poignant and um, pretty powerful. The woman said, poverty is and has been the price of my laborious life. There seem to have been many improvements reducing the cost of manufacturers by the invention of machinery, yet the wages of women have not advanced thereby. So I think this is something that we may all be familiar with in the work environment, whereas technology improves, it doesn't necessarily improve the, the work or the, the situation of uh, workers. When I started in Amesbury, it was the Amesbury Carriage Museum with a singular focus on carriages. And happily, we're able to expand our focus and explore the story that, um, where they made actually a lot more than just carriages. But there was a time where Amesbury was thought of as the carriage center of the wor world. And here, um, some of the um, Carriage makers are outside a railroad car sending um, carriages to the World's Fair. I think this is in Buffalo, and I'm not going to remember the date, but it's interesting that um, the, uh, Amesbury is called the Paris of America, which um, is quite a, a bold um, slogan. Carriage work involved some single workers. This is a recent photograph that was shared with us. Not exactly sure where this shop was, but in the background is um, an advertisement from the Moral Carriage Factory, which is seen here. There are quite a number of workers and examples of the carriages that they were making. And then one of the traditions in Amesbury, here's a view of what was called a repository, was to have an annual open house where every spring people could come to Amesbury and see the variety of carriages that had been made. That's from the Folger and Drummond Company. And here's a view of their, uh, their building. And then a second view that shows that same building on the right with the panoramic view of the textile mills and other carriage shops that were in um, the lower uh, mill yard. 25 years later, same view, but what's changed is instead of Folger and Drummer on the right, we have the Walker Wells Company. And if you can imagine, and, it, and it's not a hard thing to understand, the, tr the transition from carriages to automobiles dramatically affected the work experience in Amesbury. So Walker Wells, this is a, a um, photograph of some of the bodies that they made. They didn't make the entire the car. They made the bodies that were then shipped by rail to um, different manufacturers who put them on cars. And here's an example of Pierce Arrow and the same kind of body that was being made by Walker Wells. Another view 
of the Courier Cameron shop. And this is actually one of the more notable and important shops in Amesbury, where they were contracted with the Stanley Company to make bodies. And they made about 90% of the body for Stanley. So here's an 1895 Stanley steamer. And yes, there is a steam engine in that. And then if you look at one of the Bailey whalebone wagons, this is a horse-drawn vehicle. You can see how they could say um, the horseless carriage was really a thing with a motor added to what had been a horse-drawn vehicle. It's interesting too that even with the introduction of the automobile, horse-drawn vehicles remained a thing into the 1920s. And we will have a speaker, uh, Robert Casey, who's from a former curator from the Henry Ford, who will be exploring that uh, evolution, um, carriage making to automobiles. And he'll be speaking with us on June 1st. The Biddle and Smart Company was one of the largest companies making automobile bodies in Amesbury. It's a view of three of their factory buildings with a number of their workers on top for a flag raising celebration. <clears throat> a view in 1926 of some of the workers and what they're doing here is shaping the aluminum pieces that would then be um, included in the bodies. And here um, is a view of a, a 1926 Hudson, it's a super six. And this was an example of the kind of body work that was done in Amesbury. And in one of my favorite views, this is another company that um, bodied a Cadillac in 1920, Hollander and Morrill. Um, and they actually occupied mill number two, which is where the Industrial History Center is. And for those who are familiar with the mill yard, that view beyond the Cadillac is looking down through what is called the Gateway Arch into Market Square. And here's a view looking the other direction towards what is mill number two and will be the Industrial History Center. So one of the most important parts of our work at the Carriage Museum is connecting people to place. Here's a 1910 view of Market Square, where you can see the buildings of the textile company, Hamilton Manufacturing Company, and a large smokestack that was on the place of the bakehouse. If people come to Amesbury today and are in Market Square, can enjoy a cup of coffee at the bakehouse. Smokestack is gone. The mill building, which was mill number eight, is gone. And the building on the right has been shortened. Here's the view of it today. And I, I, very early on in my work in Amesbury, the superintendent of schools made the point that students in Amesbury really weren't connected to their community. So in a very literal way, the work of the Carriage Museum is focused on helping people connect to that part of their past. So we're developing something called the Industrial History Center. You can learn about that by going to industrialhistorycenter.org. Here's the, the, the location we have, um, and I'll show you a little bit of our space. This is actually for people who aren't familiar with Amesbury, highly recommend going to the front side of the building where you can tour and shop at Amesbury Industrial Supply. Here's an artist's rendering of what we're developing. Um, you can see we have a plaza and to the right is where Flatbread Pizza is located. Took this photograph actually this morning. Um, just last week, um, our um, landscape company, Rye Beach Landscaping, completed the hardscape. We're awaiting a canopy and for a local a landscaping company to put in the plant material. And inside, we'll have an exhibit space, we'll have a community meeting room, and we'll have a place for school groups, for workshops and tours. This is what it looks like. Um, I think a um, recent photograph, we've added a little bit more to it, but you can see what the space looks like. We've maintained a lot of the original fabric and added, um, tried to intrude as gently as possible in the space so people can um, uh, really get a sense of the uh, fabric of this building. 
mission of the Carriage Museum, champion the history of Amesbury's industry and people, our vision, a community inspired by Amesbury history. You can go to our website. We have two of them, but go to amesburycarriagemuseum.com and you can put your name on our e-news list and you'll learn about our public programs. So two recent events that we did. And here um, for the past several years, it didn't happen in 2020, but the Carriage Museum has recruited vintage automobiles to the Amesbury Car Show. The maroon car is a Stanley Steamer. The two cars in the middle are Franklin autos that were built by, the bodies built by Walker Wells and the gray body that you can just see in the background is a Hudson that was made in 1926. So it's really quite a thing to have these vehicles come back to Amesbury. So um, using the slogan, this was the inserting, and I'm sorry, this was the insulting motto that was painted on the banner um, during the Derby strike. I like to say, come with us and we will do you good. I invite you to become a member to support the Amesbury Carriage Museum. As I mentioned, you can sign up by going to our website and join our e-newsletter. We've been sending a newsletter out once a week and you can help us with a don donation. We're still fundraising to finish the History Center. And when it's done, I think it'll be quite a thing. And I hope you and like the rest of the community will be proud and eager users of our um, History Center. So I'll thank Joan again for the invitation. I think I've I'm just about on time, so we can take some questions. And um, thank you all. It's nice to be here. Well, thank you, John. That was excellent. Um, this is where we ask everybody if they'd like to, to unmute themselves or turn on their video. Um, I can help facilitate questions either through the chat room if nobody wants to speak or be seen, <laughs> um, or you are welcome to be brave and bold and step forward with a question. I'm getting a couple comments of thank you very much. It was excellent. So appreciate Janice for that. Glad to do it. I'm thrilled um, to. I'll, I'll just jump in since um, somebody might be still fumbling with the uh, controls, but I just wanted to say that you mentioned tours, not only to me when I came to visit and then now just again, can you talk a little bit about how that how that's going to work? I know that they're outdoor architectural kind of walking tours. Right. You know? So we've done tours. Actually, uh, um, one of my volunteers, Ron Kladinsky of Newburyport, also involved with a group called the Society for Industrial Archaeology. Ron's was one of the first emails that I got when I started at the Carriage Museum, and we organized a special tour for the regional chapter for the Society for Industrial Archaeology. So that has been a foundation for some of our programming. And in fact, we've developed school programs around that tour as well. So our plan is at the Industrial History Center on a regular schedule, we'll be offering walking tours. I am hoping it will be once a week and our themes will you know, rotate. It won't just be about the mill yard but we can take people into the carriage hill, talk about carriage making. Uh, there's different sites we can spotlight that are related to industrial, um, to the history of labor and then architectural tours and, and more. So it's, it's something that we have a couple tours already in the can, but we wanna create a, a, a more robust roster that can keep people coming back into the mill yard. Thank you. Yeah. I do see one question here. Um, uh, Mary and Linda asked, did the auto bodies made in Amesbury include any mass production lines invented by Henry Ford? Yeah, and that, that's an awesome question because there is kind of a, a rumor, a legend, uh, something we haven't been able to find that Henry Ford actually came through Amesbury and looked at how carriages were being made and used mm -hmm. some of that same kind of technology for the Model T. Um, you know, I, I, I don't know. I mean, it, it, it's a great question. We have, I, I showed you an image of a Bailey whalebone road wagon, 
The Bailey family is very active in Amesbury. Um, Bart Bailey has a family collection with images of the manufacturing process. So in our, our plans, or at least in my plans, is to do a more complete study of the actual process of manufacturing. It's a great question and we don't have enough detail to really answer it fully. So stay tuned, Mary. We love, you know, just keep up with us and you'll learn more. More research to come. Yeah, and I love it. I have job security for sure. Yeah. Um, can you elaborate a little bit between the connection of Newburyport and Amesbury's um, industry? You know, I know that there were a couple of reference yeah. that you made in the Jacob Perkins and just yeah. Also yeah. advertisements. <laughs> yeah, I think that's a re another really good question. And, and part of our work is really to document the connection more completely. And we struggle with no real archive to help us with that. Um, it, I think there is a history of Paul Moody, whose family had a mill on the Parker River in Raleigh. And at that mill site, um, there was, I think, Jacob Perkins began to explore developing a nail making machine. And the flow of water there is just not nearly the same as what was in Amesbury. So for industrialists who were trying to expand their capacity coming to a place where there was more water power was really a thing. And that was important. So Paul, um, Jacob Perkins came to Amesbury in 1796. He brought the apprentice Paul Moody to Amesbury with him. And actually Moody went on from Amesbury in 1814, where he was hired by this company, the Boston Manufacturing Company, who started uh, producing cloth in Waltham. And then from Waltham, that system became known as the Lowell system, and or the, I guess it was called the Waltham system. It was applied in Lowell, where that large manufacturing city was developed by the Boston Manufacturing Company with Paul Moody, who had come from Georgetown through Amesbury to Waltham and then to Lowell. So we'd like to know more. Well, Newburyport was important because it was an outlet for trade. Um, and um, the Scoville brothers who came from Ireland, I believe, and brought some of the English technology and they developed the carding machines, started in Newburyport, but that technology um, spread west and even onto Andover. But Paul Moody was doing machine building for the Schofields using that technology. So it's a, it's a complicated question and something that you know we, we really enjoy exploring. I understand there's a few other questions, but I'm not seeing them. So I really invite if people are just dying to get an answer, um, please let me know. So I see there is a question. I just put up the chat and somebody has asked if um, we participate in Amesbury Days. Yes. Thank you. So I, I do see that. And the Carriage Museum does, and we will. Um, Amesbury Days is gonna happen at the end of June this year, it'll be a limited event. Um, our history center will be opening and we will be able to invite people and it will not be complete. So I hope people won't be disappointed. Our plan for the history center is to have a series of openings through the summer and into the fall with a grand celebration we think sometime in October. John, this is Sue Bernhardt. One of the chats mentions about the significance of the ghost trail to carriage making. Oh, right. Your significance? Yeah, so um, they call it, the ghost trail is based on one of the strategies that carriage makers use. They covered their carriages in muslin and they put them on the back of a flat car. And so these, um, the bodies of carriages, you know, were really just white sheets of muslin and they would be shipped down to Boston where they could be distributed. So the, I, I didn't show a photo of that, but if you could see the um, image, it would line up very well on the whole idea of a ghost train. And so the ghost trail now is a walking trail where the rail line used to be. 
I have a question, John. Um, will you be um, participating in the sales and trails this year in August with the Essex Heritage Foundation? Yeah, that, um, we haven't done that yet. I think when we have a venue, we'll be looking at that. Mm -hmm. Essex, Essex, Essex Heritage is a really important organization for our region. And I actually, I'm on, I guess I'm what they call, not a board member, but a director, a community advocate for them. And the Carriage Museum received a, a small grant from Essex Heritage that we're actually gonna be using to expand our walking tour program. So that project's gonna begin in July. Um, yeah, I, um, so I, I'm gonna say probably not this year, but in the future, I know that'll be something that'll be important to us. I'm reading something from Sally Nutt. Um, she's saying that to her understanding, shipbuilding was huge on the Merrimack in the 1700s. Yep. Yep. During that time, was there any industrial support along the powwow in what is now downtown Amesbury? Yeah. Might have segued into the industry. Yeah. So that period in the 1700s, and actually, I think there was shipbuilding that was happening in the 1600s. Um, last fall, we did a virtual program called The Early Industries of Amesbury. And this is on the Amesbury Carriage Museum YouTube channel. One of our volunteers, his name is Steve Klumps, who is a member of the Amesbury Historic Commission and it's been a 40 year resident of Amesbury and quite enthusiastic about the history of shipbuilding. In the lower powwow, there were actually wharfs in the 1690s where ships were built. They were sent down the powwow and then they went to Newburyport where the spars were put on them. So there are a number of important ships that came from Amesbury. I'm not gonna remember them all, but I should think the, and this was on one of the shipyards on the Merrimack where the ship Alliance was made. It was one of the first um, naval vessel, vessels, part of the uh, early United States Navy. The whale ship Essex was also built at a Amesbury shipyard. And um, if you are really interested in this, I, I do recommend looking at the YouTube that we have of Steve's talk, because it's quite remarkable, the skill and workmanship that was happening in Amesbury shipyards. We had sawmills on the powwow in the 1640s, and then later grist mills. So we were using water power to generate the material that was really important for the shipbuilding industry. It's a great little town and it's a wonderful, um, you know, uh, story. And I love seeing the transition from the carriage to the automobile. I've, I've yep. often have seen that similarities and to be able to who depict that in yep. one geographical location is quite remarkable. Yeah, so, um, it, it's there's there's a lot to learn. And I have to tell you that working with our survey group and looking at that history, it's you know, really every, it seems like every month when we meet, somebody has a new discovery. And, and one of the events that happened in Amesbury, because you know, we do celebrate our history as carriage town, if you will, but there were more automobile bodies made in Amesbury than there were carriages. Hmm. One of the things that happened in 1930 is virtually overnight that industry stopped. So how that affected the town right in the midst of the depression, how did people pivot to some other kind of work situation? Um, it hasn't really been well studied. I think mostly because there aren't great archives available to learn that story, but resilience and the fortitude that made, if you will, Amesbury the home of the productive class is a really important part of the story that we wanna to discover. And that's part of our community history. Well, I think uh, unless I hear anybody wave or type in another quick question, I think we have time for one more. Otherwise, you know, John, this was great. I really enjoyed it. Um, I, oh, oh. E e Emily Hoffman says a hat manufacturing. Right. <laughs> well, so that's, you know, uh, there, Emily, there is something called the Merrimack Hat Museum but nobody has written a full history of hat making in Amesbury. Mm -hmm. And in some of our early maps, we have seen evidence of hat shops, hat factories, if you will, and they must be small scale in the 1700s. 
And if you remember that advertisement for carding wool, it was for textile makers and for hat makers. So that predates the Merrimack Hat Company that didn't start until the 1850s. So there's another story that you know is waiting to be written. I think uh, just before the pandemic hit, we were able to acquire a collection of photographs of the Merrimack Hat Company that were made in the 1940s. And at that time, it was a national firm, it was one of the largest hat companies in the United States. Um, so it's something I look forward to. And, um, you know, I don't know that it'll be me writing that history, but we, we definitely do welcome volunteers who are interested in learning, doing research and helping us build our narrative. So um, if people are interested, send me uh, an email. So John, are these woolen hats or felt hats or? Yeah. yeah, so they were, I think mostly wool, but they also did use animal fur for it. I don't think they were doing beaver, but I don't know. But um, the, in the description that we've seen, hat making in Amesbury was wool, which is felt and probably a lower grade hat than um, hats made with animal fur like beaver. Um, it's interesting, and you know, this links into kind of an environmental history. Um, you know, the, these hat shops were located right on the river. So as they were processing the fiber to make the hats, the water was being used to flush out the dye vats and the chemical vats that were being used. And we're very certain that this was not a friendly chemi chemistry to have in the water that was you were using for your daily life. So it's a great question and it's a really interesting um, opportunity for doing more study. Well, thank you. Um, yeah. It seems like uh, we've exhausted all of our uh, yeah. well, time as well as our questions and curiosities. Yeah. And I really would encourage people to go discover this area. It's really remarkable and, and it's, it's a wonderful little um, Hamlet alongside that river. Yeah. I like the description of being it being ugly because I find it quite intriguing. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, yeah, people reach out, get involved with the Carriage Museum. I welcome that. I think we have, you know, a, a partnership with the Custom House. And I look forward to more work with Joan and her group. And um, you know, onward to great things. And I look to see people involved with the Carriage Museum. So thank you, Joan. Glad okay. to be with you this evening. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Well, good night, everyone. Stay safe. And uh, hopefully we'll see everyone outside next uh, first Friday. <laughs>